Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence, and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 1 and I'll be reading verses 35 through 38. And this is what it says. Again the next day John was standing and two of his disciples and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? Let's pray. Lord, this day of worship, it belongs to you. May we be transformed by it. Thank you that we get to take part in it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, I'd like to start us off with a short video I'd like to show you. You're about to meet Michael. He lives fast as a self-made millionaire. You didn't have to dress up, it's all right. You're gonna photograph Michael. He's actually saved somebody's life. Michael is an ex-inmate. He's a commercial fisherman. Michael claims to be psychic. Nice to meet you. Michael's a former alcoholic. Here's your camera. I would like you to flesh out the essence of who he is. What would you like out of this? What would you like the photograph to say about you? Do you find that being a psychic impacts much on your day-to-day -day life? I can see this is emotional for you. So. <laughs> like to like get to know the person. You've only got 10 minutes, right? I think you're a guy that's put yourself out there. You're not hiding anything. My plan was to find out about whoever it was and to try and get that. And what I learned from him is he's incredibly brave. It was really intense. Pull this shirt out. Sorry. I wanted to see the nature of the person, which then present a challenge. How do you portray him as a fisherman? That's perfect. He's a self-made millionaire and sort of a little bit intimidating. I wasn't going for a beautiful, nice, perfectly lit portrait. I just want to try bring out something of who you are. I think that you just treat people like the everyday people, like everybody is. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I hope I've got that guy's bravery on the film. So it was a very intimidating environment. Can't see your work. Mm -hmm. I like the Thank empty you. chair next to it too. Because it's, it's a totally different person. <laughs> Almost looks like six different people. So not everything I told you today was true. I'm not a fisherman. I am not an alcoholic. The GFC hit me hard, but I've never been a millionaire. I've never been in prison. I am a Bondi lifesaver, but the story we talked about never did happen. Not psychic, can barely spell it. Before I knew there were different characters in this, I thought, that's really strange. These don't look like portraits of the character I thought you were. You've always got your own preconceptions and you've got your ideas. It pushed me into a, a position and a space that I wouldn't normally be in. You have to dig a lot deeper. It means you've got to be, I think you're a lot more creative to, to work out how you're going to play things. Did you get the tag at the end? 
A photograph is shaped more by the person behind the camera than the person in front of it. I don't think it's just photographers who have a way of seeing things. I think it's a part of human nature. I think it's you and me as well. We'd like to believe that seeing is believing, but the opposite is true. Believing is seeing. We see most often what we expect to see. We hear most often what we expect to hear. This is the beginning of the Gospel of John. And two of, of, of John the Baptist's disciples hear John say, point to Jesus, the Lamb of God. And they go to Jesus. And Jesus turns to them, and these are the first words of Jesus in the entire Gospel of John. He, he asks a question. Jesus says, what do you seek? And a strange thing is that John's disciples don't answer. They answer the question with the question, where are you staying? Well, the question, what do you seek? What do you seek? What are you looking for? What do you expect to see? What do you believe that you'll see and hear? It's left for the reader to answer throughout the rest of the book. And that's what I want to touch on this morning. That's what I want to talk about is, what do you seek? What do you expect to see? What do you expect to hear? That what we seek, what we expect to see, what we expect to hear, it makes a difference. It makes a difference in the way that we see others. When I was in sixth grade, group of guys, we were going out to P.E. And the chatter for the day was that Greg and Jim were going to fight. They were best friends, and about every two or three months, they would get into it. They'd have too much of each other, and one would explode and say, we're going to fight. And it was always a threat. It never happened, but it was always a threat. And we began to talk, who do you think would win? You know, Jim's a little taller, but Greg's a little stronger. And, and then it, it moved pretty quickly from who do you think would win to, who is the one person that you wouldn't fight in the sixth grade? Well, everybody, it was unanimous. Tony. Tony was the biggest, strongest kid in the sixth grade. And I don't remember who it was, but went around asking each one of the boys as we were headed out to pee, would you fight Tony? And I, no, I wouldn't fight Tony. They were going around, and then it came to me. Would you fight Tony? And I thought about it. I said, well, if he hit me in the face, I would. You know, you, you get away with, you know, plugging me in the arm or the leg or something like that, in the face. That, that was just, that was beyond the pale. That was something, I, no, if you hit me in the face, I would. And as we were talking, I turned around and I looked behind it, and guess who was standing behind us? <laughs> it was Tony. Didn't know if he had heard or if he hadn't. But everybody got real quiet as we went out. We were playing baseball that day, and it went in his it was my turn to come to bat. I hit the ball into the outfield, and I tried to stretch a single into a double. And as I came around first base and was running towards second, I could see I was going to be tagged out by the second baseman. And guess who the second baseman was? There was Big Tony. He was ready to take the throw from the outfield, and I was sure I was going to be out. I still hustled, and I slid, knowing that he was going to tag me. But he didn't tag me in the foot. He didn't tag me in the leg. He tagged me in the face. And I was certain I knew why. I was certain it was because he had heard me say that. And he was, he was challenging me. He was daring me. Would I really do that? Would I really fight the biggest kid in the class if he hit me in the face? And that's what he was doing. And what I did next, I regret to this day. And if anyone ever tells you they don't have regrets, it's only because they have a short memory. <laughs> That's the only reason to not have regrets. And I regret it. I, st I still do. Because when I lit into him, I could tell from his expression he was totally surprised. He hadn't heard anything that we had said. And that his feelings were more hurt that one of his friends would take offense. And, and that's the way it is. 
If we divide this world up between enemies and allies, we'll always find an enemy. We'll always find, if we're seeking out enemies, we'll always find one. And here in the Gospel of John, Judas. Judas is is ready for the, the final battle. He's ready to scoop back the furniture and just fight it all out. He has on his side the Roman soldiers and the temple guard. John chapter 18, they're meeting Jesus in the garden, and he's going to start the fight. He's going to start the fight. And John 18, verse 4 says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went and said to them, Whom do you seek? There it is. There it is. And they answered, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. If we divide this world into enemies and allies, chances are pretty good we won't be standing on the side of Jesus. Chances are pretty good we'll find an enemy but it won't be who we think it is. Jesus has more for you and me than that. Jesus has more for you and me than that. Who's behind your camera? What do you seek? What are you looking for? What are you expecting to hear? What do you seek? It makes a difference in the way that we see others. But not only that, it makes a difference in the way that we see ourselves. Man went to the doctor. He didn't feel like working. He said, Doc, I don't feel like working. I don't, I, I'm just bored. He said, I, I feel tired. And the doctor said, okay, well, he gave him some, he examined him. He gave him some tests. And after the test, after the exams, uh, the doctor was given a kind of, mm-hmm, yeah. And at the end of it, finally the man said, okay, Doc. Lay it to me straight. Don't try and sugarcoat it. Don't give it some, some complicated scientific name. Just go ahead and tell me. What is it? The doctor said, okay, you're lazy. <laughs> well, that's not exactly what the man expected to hear. So he thought for a little bit, and he said, well, doc, I appreciate it. Thank you for telling me the truth. You didn't sugarcoat it. You didn't give it a complicated scientific name, but if you could give it a complicated scientific name, please tell me because I need to go home and tell my wife. (laughs) Well, we all want to make a name for ourselves, a name that's the highest name, that's the best name, a name that'll hold us in in high esteem, a name that um, will make us well thought of by us. We'd love to have a name. And Jesus most often had trouble with those who were making a name for themselves. Jesus most often went crossways with those who were well thought of. Those who were making a name for themselves. And in John chapter 5, this is what he says. To those people, he says... Is that how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek, there it is, and do not seek the glory that is from one and only God? When we seek being well thought of, when we seek the high esteem, when we seek making a name for ourselves, we've missed. We've missed who the Bible says we are. Now, our current culture says the highest we can achieve is a a positive self-image, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible's not so concerned that we have a positive self-image as the Bible is concerned with that we have a proper self-image. And that proper self-image is we're nothing more than sinners saved by grace. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Well, that, that's not positive. 
<laughs> that all of us like sheep have gone. Certainly there's some of us that are higher or lower than others, but that's not what it says. It's that all of us like sheep have gone astray. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're nothing more than sinners. But the Bible doesn't stop there. That the Bible says we're nothing more than sinners, but we're nothing less than children of God. John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, But as many as received Him, to them He gave power to become the children of God. Power of the risen Christ for all who receive Him. Power to live a, a transformed life. That, yes, you and I are nothing more than sinners saved by grace. We stand on the same side of the judge's bench. We stand on the level ground beneath the cross. We stand on the, the side of the convicted. We don't have an opportunity to go around to the other side and sit on the side of the judge. We're on the side of the convicted. And what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me he took that sentence, he took that conviction, and he wiped it away. And when he rose from the grave on the third day to live his life through you and through me, he gave us power, power not of the defeated, but a power, the power of Jesus who conquered the cross conquered sin, conquered sin in the grave for you and for me and rose again. And we become children, children of God. Nothing more than a sinner saved by grace and nothing less than a child of God. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. That freedom, that freedom that that Jesus gives you and me is freedom. Freedom from having to make a name for ourselves. Living up to what others expect of being well thought of. What do you seek? It makes a difference in the way we see ourselves. But not only that, it makes a difference in the way that we see God. John chapter 6 Starts off with Jesus having fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fish. After he feeds the 5,000, he goes on the hillside to pray, and his disciples get in a boat to go to Capernaum. The multitudes disperse while the disciples are on the Sea of Capernaum. That night, Jesus sees from the mountaintop that the wind and the waves are starting to blow them around. They're becoming fearful, and he walks to them on the water. He calms their fears, stills the sea. And then it says in chapter 6, verse 26, excuse me, verse 24, it says, When the multitude saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. There it is again. The, the, the multitudes came seeking Jesus. And in verse 26, Jesus says why they're seeking him. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Did the multitudes come seeking Jesus so that? So that they might have their stomachs filled. So that he might meet their need, their immediate need. And Jesus doesn't get on to them for that. We're in a hard and difficult time right now. And I think more people are seeking Jesus maybe than ever before. They're seeking that he meet the immediate need. It might be loneliness. It might be healing. It might be financial crisis. It might be a need of fear or worry. It might be anxiety from from the brokenness that we're experiencing in our country. That people are seeking Jesus for an immediate need. But, but 
Jesus has more for you and me than just a so that relationship, so that he might meet the need. The, in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Yes, we can go chasing the need here, chasing a need there. But when the, the need is over, chances are pretty good that we'll find someone else who'll meet our needs. That Jesus came to give you and me a life that has the quality of eternity, that has the quality of abundance, a life that we can't get anywhere else other than seeking Him. Had lunch with a friend a little while back. It kind of tickled me what my friend said. We were catching up, and he said, you know, life's incredible. He said, I start in the morning, and I have my devotion. He said, and before I ever get to work, God shows up. That little phrase right there, God shows up. And he said, and I celebrate. He said, then when I get to work, it's not that anything bad's going on, but I'm amazed that all during the day at work, God shows up. <laughs> he said, and I, and I take note of those things, so when I get home, I can tell my wife. And my wife tells me those places at her work where God shows up. And guess what? <laughs> God shows up at our house when we're sharing with each other. Those places during the day that God showed up. And that's the way a relationship with the living Christ is. When we seek Him, not so that, but where we seek Him. Mary, she stood by the tomb seeking Jesus, not so that she might not worry, not so that she might have food, not so that she might receive comfort. She was seeking Jesus, and Mary was the first, the first to see the risen Christ. It's a relationship that He desires with, with you and me, not so that we meet a need, but because. Because he wants a relationship with you. That you might know his heart and his heart, his life, his spirit might live in you and me. This morning, it may be that um, you've been seeking enemies and allies, and you begin seeing enemies in places that enemies just aren't there. This morning it may be that you've been seeking. You've been seeking to make a name for yourself. Maybe you've been trying to overcome a name that somebody gave you a long time ago, or maybe you've been trying to live up to a name that somebody gave you a long time ago. And you've been running and running and running. And you've not been free. This morning, it may be that you've been that you've been seeking Jesus so that you might have a need or a comfort or a peace. Something that you want Jesus to do for you. Jesus has more for you and me than that. His desire is a relationship. Where His Spirit, the risen Christ, lives through you and me. And that relationship can start today. And I want to pray with you that you receive that relationship. Pray with me. Jesus, the power that you have, it's a power for life. A life that's full. A life that's abundant. A life that has the quality of eternity. And it starts right now. Lord, with the power of your grace, with the strength of your forgiveness. May we know that life that begins now, today. And we begin to follow you, not so that. We begin to follow you because. Because we love you. And because you love us. Grant us the grace in that relationship. Not one day, but this day. It's in Christ's name we pray.
Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. If you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>